So I guess I want to start just by pointing out to this photograph, you know. I've spent most of my career working in the Caribbean. The Caribbean coral reefs have been written off by virtually every major NGO uh, in America as a hopeless sort of cesspool of dead coral reefs. And this photograph is a typical photograph of the coast of Curacao only three years ago, and you notice what a horrible reef it is, and the lack of fish, and the lack of healthy coral, and all the rest. And, and, and that, um, that image is really what motivated me to do this study that I'm going to talk about. Um, Caribbean coral reefs are severely degraded um, overall, and it's widely believed that um, destruction is inevitable because of ocean warming and acidification and all the rest of it. And the consequence of that, especially in the United States, is that global change dominates the entire conversation. The vast majority of all the funds go to study climate change. Uh, they, uh, climate change drives all the policy discussions. And, and pretty much the rest of everything um, gets um, not ignored, but pushed off to the side. And so um, when I was engaged by the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network to, to try to up the quality of the science in that program, I said, well, I'm not going to do it globally because that's absurd, but I will work in the Caribbean where I, I already know a lot about it. And let's just look at virtually all the data that are available and see what the data actually tell us about the status and trends uh, of these reefs. So in the beginning, it was sort of a boring thing, you know, status and trends. But it turned out to be, uh, I think, very exciting scientifically. So we did a ton of work. We um, uh, had uh, more than 35,000 quantitative surveys of coral reefs from 1970 to 2012. There were 90 locations around the Caribbean. That's all the black dots. And there were 21 places, which are the orange, blue, and, and green symbols, where we actually had good data that went back at least to 1983, which is a pivotal date in the history of Caribbean reefs. This is about 85% of all the data that has ever been collected quantitatively by a scientist in the Caribbean over 50 years. So it's, it's a lot of data. And here, basically, are the results. I mean, these are four years of my life, um, these, um, these graphs. And right away, you see that the patterns are actually quite different from what people thought. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner is coral cover over time. Remember now, every one of these blue dots is a place, a location in some year at some time. And there's thousands of dots. You can't see them all because they're all on top of each other. But what's really striking like here is that coral cover started to decline long before 1983, which was the date at which a, a pivotal grazer, Diadema andalarum, uh, had mass mortality. And that it was all pretty much over by 1990. And it's just been waiting for Godot ever since. I mean, there, there, there is no trend in coral cover from 1990 to the present, which is really striking when you think about all the things that have been uh, going on. In the upper right-hand corner is the abundance, the cover of macroalgae. That's a very different kind of story. There was basically no seaweed on Caribbean reefs until the sea urchin died, and then seaweed exploded. This is a, a story Terry documented in his, his science paper in 1994. It, it sort of messed around a little bit, and it settled down at a depressingly large number of about 20%. And, and it is creeping up, which is perhaps the most concerning thing. Uh, the bottom left-hand corner shows that the sea urchin really did just tick the bucket. Uh, and the bottom right-hand corner is really important because what that is is all the recorded bleaching events in the Caribbean. And you can see that there really aren't any significant numbers of bleaching events until after coral cover had stabilized regionally at a very low, low level. So this is a summary of, of it all. It, it, Carl's went down uh, long before uh, in the 1970s, stabilized by 1990. The phase shift 
which has been very controversial. There have been a lot of people saying, oh, there were always a lot of seaweed. But 35,000 quantitative surveys says, no, there was not a lot of seaweed. And geriatrics like me, who actually swam around on the reefs in the 1960s and 1970s, weren't delusional in our 70s. It was really, really true. Um, corals were already declining, which is really interesting. And these major changes preceded any known major impacts of climate change. OK, but you know, this is the way science is normally done in these big meta-analyses. And you, you see an average, and, and, and you say, oh my god, it's really bad. But in fact, um, you know, what this graph, what these graphs are showing you for the corals and the macroalgae is that even in 2010 or 2011, there are places that have more than 60% live coral cover. And there are places that have virtually no macroalgae. So that variance in the data is the key discovery of those graphs. What we want to know is what's special about the places that have tons of coral and virtually no seaweed versus the others, because maybe those places can tell us what we could uh, do um, to um, do something to, to improve it. And you can see, I, I don't know if this thing is bright enough, but there are three panels there, orange graphs, uh, blue graphs, and green graphs. The orange graphs show all the places where there used to be a lot of coral cover after the sea urchin died. They dropped to very low numbers, and nothing has happened since. The blue places are places that have had a more gradual but inexorable decline. And then the green places are the places that didn't read the script. Some of them had a lot of coral to begin with and still do. Some of them didn't have so much coral and still don't have so much. But there is nothing like the degree of change over this more than 40 year period in the green places uh, compared to the blue and orange. And that's what we want to understand. We want to know why are these green places doing so well compared to the places that are doing so poorly. And um, in order to look at that, uh, you know, there, there are a million theories in our profession about why uh, coral reefs are doing badly. My favorite one, which is propagated by a former oil geologist in Florida, is that African dust is the ultimate cause of the decline of corals, which is, of course, really convenient, because it means people otherwise had nothing to do with it. Um, there are a lot of ideas, but there's not a lot of data. And so the only things, that, variables or potential drivers that we can say anything reasonably definitive about are global warming, human population density, uh, coastal pollution, and overfishing of grazing fishes. I'm going to quickly go through these in a univariate way, but I want to get fast to the multivariate analysis because this talk gets a lot more interesting when we start to look at all of these variables uh, in concert. Uh, this is slow. Ah, there we go. So um, we got um, NOAA Coral Reef Watch gave us all their data because they expected, I think, that we were going to demonstrate that climate change was the ultimate cause of Caribbean coral reef decline. And for very fine-scaled quadrats, for every one of our 90 locations, we receive data on the numbers of degree heating weeks every year uh, for every one of those 90 places. And then what we did was we looked at the proportional change in coral cover at all of those places for which there was data. So what was the cover of corals in the two years before a big heating event? What was it afterwards? Subtract the afterwards from the before, divide it by the before, and that gives you a proportional change. If the number is positive, corals became more abundant after they had a big heating event. If it's negative, they didn't. And so you then plot the proportional change in coral cover versus the number of degree heating weeks that all these places experience, and there's absolutely no relationship. And that's not surprising when you think about it, because the pattern of coral decline was all over by 1990, and the bleaching events were after that. But it's still, I mean, 
The, the Carl Reef Watch people still don't believe this. They keep saying, well, here's some more data. Analyze it this way. I cannot make this pattern go away. I cannot get a significant result. I, I lost one year trying to satisfy them. OK, but human population density actually, surprise, uh, really does make a difference. These are data on coral cover um, in the mo today in the most recent time interval, so from 1999 to the uh, present, versus the number of residents and the number of visitors, uh, the visitors are per kilometer square per year. And you can see there's some pretty amazing variation. The extreme right-hand dot in the bottom graph is St. Thomas, which gets almost 30,000 visitors per square kilometer per year, not to mention five gigantic cruise ships tied up at the wharf at the same time and whatever. And, and what you clearly see here is that there's virtually no points in the upper right-hand quadrant. There are not of a lot of places uh, that have more than the average coral cover for the entire region and more than the average number of residents or more than the average number of visitors, with the striking exception of Bermuda. And so you ask, well, what's different about Bermuda? And the answer is law, and that they actually have laws that they enforce, and they take them very seriously, and they've been doing it since 1990. And you see this striking difference, whereas the coral reefs of my country are just a grotesque embarrassment, and you can see that places like the Florida Keys, and I'll show you more of the US Virgin Islands, are just as bad as Jamaica, and that's really bad. OK, coastal pollution, you would have thought this was something scientists were measuring. But the fact of the matter is that there is no systematically collected data on water quality throughout the Caribbean. Um, we did manage to find some Seiki disk, you know, really high-tech Seiki disk measurements, and in the few places, like uh, Caribou Cay in Belize, where they uh, really steadfastly made the observations over and over and over uh, for 20 years, there is this very concerning, striking decline in water quality as measured by transparency over 20 years. And the same is true at La Parguera, Puerto Rico, and a couple of other places. Um, and and, and the, the, this data that you're looking at are for an offshore reef, way, way off from the mainland, and yet it's still showing this decline. But because of a lack of data of this quality elsewhere, I'm just going to use human population density as a proxy for water quality. And in fact, there's a lot of good data to show that there's a highly positive correlation between population density and, and negative correlation between population density and water quality. OK, and then the last factor is overfishing of herbivores. And, um, and this is really frustrating. We, we, Terry sponsored, I think, three workshops where we all got together to go over these data. And, and we all knew in our heart of hearts that herbivores were important, but nobody was collecting biomass data on herbivorous fish. Um, before the 1990s. Um, but then it occurred to us that, in fact, there was super good experimental evidence by people like Mark Hay and Carpenter that had shown that when diadema was still alive, when this sea urchin was still common in the Caribbean, there was a very strong negative correlation between the abundance of the sea urchin herbivore and the parrotfish herbivore. And this has been demonstrated in circumstantial data and field studies, but it had also been demonstrated experimentally. And there were no counterexamples. So that justified using the abundance of the sea urchin as a proxy for the abundance of the parrotfish. And then we could go back and we could get a, a um, classification of the degree of fishing of reefs based on that. And, and we did that for 17 locations that had long-term data out of those 21. And you can see there's a very striking separation between the places that we classified as less fished because they had very few sea urchins versus the places that were uh, overfished that had lots of them. And uh, if you ask the question then, what's the relationship of coral cover to the degree of fishing of herbivores way back before 1983, you get this absolutely amazing result. On the left, you have 
all of the data on coral cover over time for the places that were not overfished early on. And on the right, the places that were, there's no data in the upper right-hand quadrant for the places that had been overfished before. After 1984, the mean coral abundance at the less fish places is statistically significantly higher than the other all the way through the data set. Okay, and, and why uh, is this pattern there? I think we at this point know very clearly that macroalgae are really bad for corals because they promote disease, they uh, repress coral growth, they repress coral recruitment. Uh, this has been shown in tons of experiments and I don't want to belabor it. Come on. It's not moving. Uh, okay, now it is. So those are all single factor analyses. I think now it starts to get interesting. We threw them all together in a generalized linear model. Um, we had fishing as a two level factor. We threw hurricanes in because people would never shut up about hurricanes being important. Uh, we had cumulative degree heating weeks and population density. And then we did the analysis for the diff three different periods and you get this amazing result, which is in the first time interval Nothing is significant except for human population density in a low level. After the sea urchin dies from 1984 on, fishing and human population density are highly uh, significant in terms of their negative effect on coral cover. Hurricanes are totally insignificant and you get this bizarre result that degree heating weeks are good for corals. That there's a positive relationship between the amount of heating and the abundance of corals uh, on the reefs, um, which bothered me a lot, but it's actually easy to understand. Bermuda and the flower garden banks are protected, and I mean protected. They also experienced the highest amount of heating in those time intervals of any other place in the Caribbean. But because, I'm the, the because of course is my interpretation, they were highly protected, the corals survived, and those places drive the relationship. In contrast, the US Virgin Islands experienced the next highest amount of heating, but they're grossly overfished. They have all those tourist boats, the cruise ships. Um, virtually nothing is done to regulate development, and more than half the corals, corals died. And then Bonaire, which is sort of the next one down in terms of the amount of heating, and which has much better governance and all the rest of it showed very minor change. So what these results are saying is that bizarre relationship between the amount of coral cover and the amount of heating that occurred is really misleading. What's really going on is that the places were protected what, that were heated badly did well and the others did not. And then we did a structural equation analysis which frankly is something I'm not sure I understand. Um, and um, got exactly the same result, except it got more interesting because we had this interaction between warming and fishing that was even more uh, powerful than the, the effect of fishing alone. And I think that fishing times warming interaction is a macroalgae effect. And if I were young, I'd actually study that. And somebody really ought to do it because I think this would be um, the key piece of evidence that we could use for management. So summarizing all these biophysical results so I can get to the last fun slide, there has been a 50% decline in Caribbean coral cover since the 1970s, but there are some places that are really healthy and we need to understand that. The primary drivers of the decline were diseases in the 1970s and 1980s affecting a cropper. We have no idea why that happened. Uh, which is why I didn't talk about it, but then following the disease, it's local impacts of overfishing and coastal development in relation to numbers of people. So it's local drivers of decline, not global drivers of decline. It was pretty much all over by 1990, so um, that's why we don't see the kind of um, warming effect people affected. We have a mechanism in the macroalgae, and and this thing is local, 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 which is not what US policy addresses, by the way. Okay, now these results, I, and this to me is the most fun part of the whole study, 
suggest that degradation is reversible. I put that in quotes because you can't go home again. You never go back to the way it was. But it, it strongly suggests that we could go in a quote unquote good direction, a direction in which there would be more coral cover and more fish uh, if we stop doing the local stuff that we're doing. So, and, and if that's true, then I should be able to predict coral cover any place in the Caribbean with no biological data, simply by saying how good is the governance and other socioeconomic factors. And if I can do that, well, hey, we, you know, I can just predict uh, what I'm going to see before I ever get in the water. So we, we tested that for the 21 locations with the long-term data, and we used standard metrics of governance, wealth, uh, population density, and fisheries regulations, and we did a, an ordination analysis on that, uh, and I'll show you here. So here are the factors. You know, there's this sort of UN index of governance, um, and you can say what you want about it. Uh, you could try to factor them out in some way or another, except that they're all so highly correlated with each other. I'm not sure that's worth it. And then GDP, local population density, and then rank effectiveness of fishing regulations. None, some, and they actually do it. Okay, that's our highly precise classification of regulation. And here's the result. And this is a, a complicated slide, so I, I want to talk about it. So what you see here is the first principal component and the second principal component. So this is an ordination graph of all the different places. Forget about the coral cover for a moment. And you see how do all these different places sort out in ordination space based on governance and population density, based only on socioeconomic factors. Then you ask the question, what is the relationship between the proportional change in coral cover over the last 40 years to the first principal component, which explains two thirds of all the variability among the sites? And what you get is this beautiful, highly significant relationship, uh, much better than I ever thought it would be, that says if I know how many people there are, how well they govern themselves, how wealthy they are, and whether or not they have any regulations, I can predict coral cover with a confidence of 0.01%. Uh, and so, boom, that's it. And what does that tell you? That tells you that it's us, period. Um, sure, we need more science. Science is really, really important. Um, for one, we'd really like to understand that macroalgae warming thing and a million other questions, which is why the, the center exists. But if I'm a policymaker in the Caribbean, I don't need any more science to say, I've got to clean up governments, think about how I can ameliorate population density, and blah, blah, blah. So uh, to conclude, we could actually I, and, and, and I had an op-ed in the New York Times about this. It was titled, We Can Restore Caribbean Coral Reefs, and it was really popular because that's what people want to hear, and that's what Aidan was saying. But in fact, we've got the data that show that the places, the few places, Bermuda, the Flower Garden Banks, Bonaire, to a lesser extent, Curacao, that have actually used common sense and regulated their local activities have uh, reefs in much better condition. We are obsessed with climate change. Climate change is terrifying, it's horrible, it's going to get worse. We've not to be, got to be worried about it. But up until now, in the Caribbean at least, it might not be true here, I have no idea, climate change has been a secondary factor. And the places that have suffered most from coral bleaching are the places that are screwed locally by too many people, too many, much development, and overfishing. So these places are examples of what we could do if we actually wanted to get our act together. I am utterly confident that everything I've described is, is just as true for the inner Great Barrier Reef. In my lifetime, I've seen that go from being exquisitely beautiful to a garbage dump. And it's exactly the same story. You could fix that if you took care of those local drivers. And thank you very much.